Hi guys, so welcome to the session uh, for um, the uh, FRCS uh, clinical fiber preparation. We've got Mr. Hosni, he's giving us the uh, the Viva today, and we've got uh, Ruby who's going to uh, be taking the virus. Okay, so uh, to you, Mr. Hosni. Uh, okay, so let's close this. Uh, okay, so I'll start off with some uh, basic upper limb short cases. Uh, so who's, who's the first candidate, sorry? So I think I'm the only candidate. <laughs> okay, all right, great. Okay, good. Well, uh, so uh, this is a photograph of a six-year-old boy. Uh, if you could describe what you see, please. So this is a clinical picture showing an, a less, not well-developed upper limb with deviation toward the radial side. A crowding of the fingers and um, it is query hypoplastic sump. It is a clinical picture which correlates with a radial club hand. Yes, great, correct. And uh, is there anything you'd like to ask about in the history? So, um, radial club hand is usually associated with a lot of general conditions in more than 60%. So, um, a, a history uh, will include any natal prenatal and postnatal events development in general, because the patient is already developed, uh, presenting late when he has six years. I want to ask about a general condition which is really associated, including anemia, heart problems or murmurs, abnormality of the upper limb uh, in other sides, lower limb, in dysplastic pictures. Um, and there is a specific criteria regarding vitral and rectal. Uh, so development, and the function of the upper limb, which in the picture, especially the elbow function. And, yeah. Um, this is a main concern about management of this patient. Okay, and you've mentioned a lot of uh, different uh, uh, syndromes there. What in particular, would, how would you in investigate them in particular? What would you examine or investigate for? So uh, usually these patients, um, detected in uh, um, orthopedic clinic, but managed in MDT, because this patient had a, need a lot of uh, investigations, including an echo, uh, blood sorry, uh, to start to be started from the basic blood test to detect uh, Fanconi anemia. Uh, yeah. you, have, you need to have an, an appropriate auscultation of the heart and getting an uh, echo to detect any abnormal formations of the heart. Uh, most of the vector and vitreal usually presented early than six years, but usually including imported uh, anus and um, esophageal um, uh, tracheal malformations and vertebral abnormalities. Okay, uh, and you, you mentioned some, let's sort of focus on the hand. How, you know, I know it's a six-year-old boy, perhaps if he was a little bit older, how would you, how would you do an upper limb functional assessment? So generally, I will detect the alignment of the limb and then we'll ask him to abduct his shoulder and uh, flex his elbow and see how much the range of elbow is present. If there is yeah. no range of the elbow and there is no active range, I mean the bicep is not functioning, uh, this position would be favorable because it gives him a chance to uh, reach his mouse and feed himself. Otherwise, if he has a uh, proper elbow range of motion, I will assess uh, the base of the sump and see if it is stable or not. Okay. Uh, I, I believe that during this time, most probably have been go through an physiotherapy, trying to uh, lengthen the tight structures on the radial aspects. In this case, and in the presence of no contraindications, and I will proceed for an, uh, a surgical intervention in form of centralization, plus or minus uh, uh, proper uh, alignment of the sump. Now, what sort of age would that normally be done at uh, centralization? And actually, it's usually done in the first two years. OK. Uh, and uh, are you aware, uh, sort of a basic science question, I suppose, but are you aware of which gene this is related to? Yes, it is, a, it is an, a picture of a longitudinal uh, effect of grass in a limb, which is usually related to Sinicod hog and classified according to long, uh, uh, longitudinal grass disturbance according to Swanson classification. OK, uh, that's pretty much all of my questions. Uh, I thought that was very good. <laughs>
yeah, you obviously knew the subject um, and uh, without prompting, you went into all the different uh, associated uh, conditions and how you'd investigate for them and the MDT approach, which was really good. Um, any comments from anybody else? Yes, so uh, Ruby, we can't see half of your face. Why is that? Um, in my in my screen, all of my face is clearly seen. Okay. I'm not sure. So j just just make sure that we can see you. Okay. Body language is very important. Okay. Try to speak a little bit slower. So you can see at four minutes he finished everything. Mm. You want to stretch it into five minutes because if he doesn't have anything to say, that means you are not gaining any points. So you have to stretch it in such a way by you're doing the right thing by not saying anything provocative. You're you know, like it's very smooth, but just slow down. OK, try to, to stop saying and something and so on, like we said before. And I think otherwise that's fine. A question what they can ask you, what does Sonic Hedgehog stand for? Why do they name it Sonic Hedgehog? No, I have no idea, sorry. <laughs> okay, so you know the Nintendo games? No. No, you no Super Mario? No. Okay, so this is, is for you to look at today. Yeah. If you look at Super Mario, and so, uh, Sonic Hedgehog, it, to the scientist who saw this, he thought that it looked like one of the characters in uh, Super Nintendo Super Mario. Okay, yeah. this is why they they called it that. So we have Jags uh, uh, who's just passed and he's doing uh, uh, an a Pete's job in in Evelina. So uh, Jag, Jag, do you have any comments you want to make about uh, the? about Ruby's performance? No, I am. Um, so I was listening to that. I thought that was very smooth, actually. I think the pace was actually probably right. Um, the the way he answered the questions, I, I agree, were not provocative. They weren't controversial, pretty straightforward answers, which would be expected. And I know that when we were practicing before, we kind of stayed away from the basic science sonic hedgehog. And um, we've tried to, um, and Ruby's quite knowledgeable, which he knows anyway, but we try to say, steer that away for kind of later questions, which he, he did, which was good, um, because you want to get on to clinical management. But I think a couple of things to say to start with is that um, the approach was good. I think you got prompted, um, once, you, once you've said that this is a um, radial club hand, you can just say, look, I, I want to take a history and examination. It's associated with life threatening conditions associated with Vata, Vactra, Holt or Arm, Fanconi's anemia um, and, and um, thrombocytopenic um, absent radius. Yeah. And I think if you just bang those out straight away without being prompted, these required MDT approach, required paediatricians, geneticists, um, ultrasound of the kid um, renal, um, cardiac and needs a blood film. Um, and then you can kind of leave it at that, probably take a breath and see if they want to, where they want to steer you because they will direct you at that stage where they want to go. But apart from that, I think everything was great. Jag, to you, how would you get a, a, a seven or an eight? And how would you fail the station? So I think the safety question here in number um, a six would be to not talk about those associated conditions. I think that's a six. And I think the second thing is assessing the elbow function because a lot of these kids by to what I understand, by six years of age, um, have adapted their their upper limb for feeding and for um, hygiene, but more importantly for um, feeding. So if you jump in without assessing that and say, I oh, will do a centralization or a politization or whatever you, the options you end up discussing, I think that probably shows that you don't understand because you could leave this alone um, if the patient's adapted with it and has got to six years of age. Um, but I think Apart from um, but the high, higher questions would be the answers would be, you know, releasing the radial side when you get surgical management, releasing the radial sided tight, tight structures, doing um, extensor um, tendon releases, um, doing a Evans bilobe incision. And then if there's a recurrence, you can do use a external fixator. But I think once you're into those, say, those, those kind of higher questions, I think you're probably on to eights. Yeah. 
I agree, and I, I think I have to say as well that you, you know if you're if you're onto a winner, like if if you if you see something and you think I know this, just blast it if you can, because you will get stations where you're completely flummoxed. Like I, my first short case was uh, psoriatic arthritis, um, uh, and and I didn't see the psoriatic patches until about four minutes into the short case. Um, and I was talking about all the tiny little abnormalities of the fingers and I could just tell the examiner wasn't interested and I didn't know where to go and I wasn't being prompted. And then at four minutes, I noticed the patches and I'm like, oh my God, this is psoriatic arthropathy. And I started talking about all the things that they're interested in. And, and then as the bell rung, he asked me, okay, what, you know, what he really wants to know was what position would you fuse the elbows in, if it, especially if it was a bilateral fusion. And I couldn't answer it because the bell had gone. So you will get stations where you don't know what, you know, you, you think you'll get a five or a six or, you know, you're not going to do super well in. And that's almost inevitable. You know, it happens on a day, you miss something obvious, you know, nerves, etc. So on the stations that you're onto a winner where you're like, oh, I know this, just absolutely nail it. Get, you know, just that's my advice anyway, is to, you know, make sure you get a seven or an eight if you can, because you're going to need it in the stations where you just don't know what's going on and the time runs out. Great. OK, so th th this is a very good scenario for a, a radio club hand. Mm. So are you ready for uh, Ruby for the next? Yes. OK, great. So five uh, minutes time starts whenever you're ready, Mr. Hosni. Sure. Uh, let's go straight on to this one. Uh, so this is a 14 year old boy in your elective clinic. He's noticed lumps around his shoulder. Uh, what questions would you like to ask? So um, I understand that it's a multiple of, uh, lumps, it's not just one. Correct, yes. So I want to ask when he dentists this one and if it's this lumps increasing in size or not. And can I get the answer for these questions? Uh, anything else you'd want to ask before I get into that? Yeah, if, if this lumps is increasing in size, is, is it accompanying fever or uh, tenderness over the site, warm, um, red color. I need to know if this uh, patient have any other lumps in his body around yeah. knees or other sites. I need to ask if he has a family history of lumps. And, okay. and, and I need to know if this patient have recently developed any um, abnormal sensation in his, in his hand or tingling or numbness. Yeah, and if there's any pain. Uh, I'll show you an x-ray if I will. So that's a clinical radiograph of the shoulder and knee. Uh, what do you see? So um, I can see that this patient has an, a multiple uh, in multiple sites. He has an osteochondroma, which consists with familiar hereditary uh, osteochondroma. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and where else might you might might you X-ray? Where else do you do these show? So I can see in the shoulder and both knees. Sorry, what was the question again? Where else could they be? Where else would you examine? Um, I mean, other, uh, other so sites. So I would examine this the radius, rest both sides, uh, humerus both sides. It was really in, in 80% around the knee. Um, this is to have in my mind. It still there is an intent to have an osteochondroma in the spine. But they are usually towards the periphery rather than central. Yes. Uh, or posterior. Okay. Uh, and how would you manage this patient? So this patient man management is mainly um, by counseling and uh, by monitoring and giving an instructions about development of any signs which may be serious, like increasing in size, starting to have a pain and uh, in this case, we will proceed for an investigation in the form of MRI. What would you be looking for in the MRI scan? So in my MRI, I will having I will look for the the size of the cartilaginous cap. If it's exceeding 0.5, so it is maybe it it will give me an, a red flags or alarming that uh, it may be an, a development of a secondary form of uh, chondrocarcinoma on top of osteochondroma. Right, and uh, how common are those? Do you know? It's a percentage between one to five percent. 
Okay. And do you think they might be common in the younger age group or older age group, particular sites or? You know, it, it, it's usually um, in 14, which he's a male, most probably he's rich to the puberty, but usually in secondary cold sarcoma is common above 45. Right. And he's asking about excision. What would your advice be in terms of if it can be excised and when when it would be excised? So um, excisions indications will be included in his case any uh, local site irritation either to neuro to bundles or to the skin. And my advice would be waiting until the puberty and uh, fusion of this osteochondroma to avoid any recurrence. Uh, okay. All right. Well, that's all I'd like to ask about it. Um, from my point of view, I think. Hello. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Uh, from my point of view, I think you got the majority of things there, but it just needed a little bit of uh, prompting, maybe. Um, and uh, I think uh, the cartilage cap generally is worrisome if it's more than two or three millimeters, is what I remember anyway, uh, rather than 0.5 millimeter. Um, but generally, the risk of malignant transformation is much less, less than 1% if it's solitary, maybe between 5 and 10% if they've got, like this guy, a multiple hereditary exostasis. Um, but again, it's still fairly minimal in children, pediatric age, and it's, it peaks at higher, higher ages. Uh, and you'd be looking for that on the MRI scan, looking for that cartilage cap thickness. Uh, I think you could have maybe said as well, like, you know, it's, Describe the lesion. So, you know, these are multiple lesions, two centimeters. They're pedunculated mostly. They're pointing away from the physis. Their cortex is in line with the rest of the cortex of the bone. The medullary cavity is in line with the medullary cavity. You know, stuff like that, which, you know, just gives you extra points in my view. Um, and seeing as it's multiple, you know, I think again, like the previous uh, scenario, you, you know, you could get a little bit of that science say basic science it could be you know you could say autosomal dominant related to ext genes if you know that kind of stuff and it again helps you get lots of points if you know what you know if you know what it, this is uh comments from everybody else yes i have a few comments so uh, for this one uh, you can also say things other than the pedunculation uh, you can also say why is it so do you know why it's going uh, away from the the growth is extending away from the physis yeah because it uh, actually it was an escaping lesions getting because of the ring um the ring around the physis have failed to uh, contain this one so it's uh -huh. really going to the outer side Yes, so the periochondral node of Ranvier's defect allows it to grow from the physis. Yes. Yeah. So if, on, if you know it, why don't you say it? Uh, I was thinking it is not part of the clinical. It's part of the background. Pathology. So if you, yes. So and they how can they come? What in what cases would they come? Solitary. Uh, osteochondromas. So how they how they present? You mean, sir? Yes. Uh, so after what? What is the pathophysiology of them? It's usually it's uh, it's um, I believe coming after trauma. Yes, trauma. What else? Um, it's usually coming after trauma. Um, Surgery. Or, yeah, yeah. or radiation? Yes, yeah. following bone tumors. Yeah. This one is a little bit different. This is hereditary multiple uh, exostosis. So this is part of. Uh, do you know what gene would cause this? Yeah, it's one one two. And what it's what it, does it have? Uh, what type of protein? I cannot recall this son. I'm sorry. The Indian Indian hedgehog. Yeah. Okay. Also, if you are going to say that they 
have a cancer is not one to five. One to five is wrong. It's a very high number. It's actually less than one percent. OK. For a solid one, I think, yeah, yeah. For the so OK, yeah. And uh, for the the multiple. Uh, the multiple, I, think, I think the multiple have a higher rate. The, yes. The, the solitary one has has no less than one percent, and usually randomly randomly to have a cancer. But uh, the the familiar the familiar hereditary one have a higher rate than solitary. But I cannot remember the name, number. It's around one one to five. This is what I remember. No, it's higher than this. It's yeah. about ten percent. The multiple hereditary exostosis. What other associations might you have with it? Hello? Uh, I cannot recall this point, sir. So. Okay. So uh, you could have deformities in the form of coxa valga. Yeah. Uh, you can have a valgus knee, patellar dislocation, shortening of the fibula, ankle valgus. For the upper limb, you can have ulnar shortening. When you say about the multiple, you can say also where does it occur? It occurs at the site of the insertion of tendons, and this is why you see it in this pattern that uh, Mr. Hosni has shown. You get me? Yes. I'm sorry, am I giving you a hard time? No, not at all. It's just an information the radio has been, but uh, for a, time, a long time of non revising. No, no problem. So this please is, don't. Uh, this is straightforward uh, information. I'm totally happy, but it's, I, I just uh, I wrongly interpreted the, the last question. What's going on? Was but actually in the exam, the the main presentation is uh, is genovalgum and uh, uh, swelling of distal radius and these issues. Yeah, it is usually associated with hereditary uh, exostosis. And the Indian hot dog is is a very common gene. Maybe I I missed it. Protein. Yeah. This, I, uh, don't worry. Okay. So, uh, Jack, do you have any other comments you'd like to make? I, I think he's on mute. Oh, there. So, uh, um, sorry, I was listening as well. I don't. Um, I think it's. I actually, I actually got this. Okay, adult. Sorry, my clinical short. Um, so lower limb short cases. Um, I think when you're showing the shoulder. Exostasis. You've got to you've got to say I want to examine the axilla before they. You know, if somebody says there's a lump, I want to ask the patients. I think I've heard somebody didn't get through the clinicals when they had patients in them because they didn't examine the axilla. The other place to examine is the well. You can't examine the pelvis, but having worked in the bone tumor unit, we used to do a pelvic X-ray before we discharge these patients at you know from the age of 16 or 18 because they can have a massive um, chondrosarcoma with intrapelvic. Which you know, which is disastrous um, for these patients. So that's kind of just showing that you understand. You've worked in a unit where you've seen this. Uh, somebody else may not may not say that, but um, I think apart from that, you know, you can say associated. It's associated clinically with nerve problems. Um, you know, you want to treat those those lesions that are that are affecting the patient most, rather than cutting them all out, which is going to be a kind of fruitless exercise. Um, Apart from that, I think that I think it's otherwise. Well done. How would you give him a seven or an eight? I think it's these are straightforward cases. I think that I don't know how how would you get a seven or eight? I think if you if you they do like if you take charge straight away, I think they have. I think it's true. They know. If you're going to pass the station well within the first 30 seconds or a minute. So once you've say they really they're really quite keen on differentials, not so much all of the um, nitty gritty of the the disease process. But if someone presents to you with a lump on their shoulder, you know you want to say this is concerning. I'd be worried about this. The pertinent questions I may ask. They ask me to always, even in the they say clinicals don't ask questions, but they wanted two or three very pertinent questions as to assessing the lump, to think you know to try and gauge what you think. And then they say, OK, what examinations are you going to do to exclude those differentials you've given? So you may say it could be an infection, it could be a tumour, it could be a previous fracture, it could be a malunion or whatever you may be, depending on what case you've got. Um, and then once you start talking about the clinical examinations, they want to know specifically 
what each examination does and how it excludes that diagnosis that you presented. So don't present a diagnosis that you're not sure about. And um, otherwise they'll ask you about the, the, the um, examination for it. And if you don't know, and if you can't verbalize it, it can, it can get quite messy. So I think for this, the differentials, realizing that it could be malignant, you discuss it with your local bone tumor unit, you're working at DGH. They may even talk about principles of biopsy with this. Um, cartilage cap is, depending on which books you read, 1.5 centimeters or even two centimeters. Um, so 10 mils, um, at least on an MRI scan. So you would get an MRI scan for these patients. Um, and yeah, I think you said chondrocarcinoma a couple of times. It's actually um, chondrosarcoma. So it, that's that's where it changes into. It doesn't change into chondro, um, carcinoma, chondrosarcoma. So I think making sure that you know the terminology as well, otherwise they may pick you up on that and then that suddenly you're backtracking and wasting 20, 30 seconds trying to work out what you said in a stressful situation. So I think they will be the marks and I reckon they will take you for the seven or eights towards principles of biopsy and then excision. I got to excision in mine and they wanted to know which planes I would use. I had a distal, um, so I had one in the ankle. Great. And what 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 planes did you go through? So uh, specifically went through the examination. Uh, what what I've actually outlined. I, I don't know what's the right or wrong answer, but that was the way I tackle that question. And um, we spoke about um, other sites. We spoke about MHE. We spoke about the physis. It's from the proliferative zone of the physis. Um, and then we spoke about um, biopsy and um, yeah exactly what I've said it, it got to excision and then the bell went okay great thank you very much Jack no worries pleasure so next uh, scenario uh, yeah okay, I've got the time five minutes starts now Okay. Uh, right. Uh, this is a clinical picture of a middle-aged uh, woman uh, and an X-ray. Uh, would you describe what you see, please? Uh, so, um, this is an, a clinical picture and X-ray. It's showing in the clinical picture, shouldering of the trapezium with the carpal joints, hyperextension. Sorry, uh, shouldering of the sump, uh, extension of the carpal joint and uh, abduction and uh, decrease of the fresh blood space. And in the X-ray, there is an evidence of trabezium metacarpal osteoarthritis advanced stage with sclerosis around the trabezium. So I think this is, uh, and just before I proceed in this, I'm not sure if this patient had any history previously of trauma, but I can see that this is, um, Trabezium metacarpal osteoarthritis, which are either an a primary osteoarthritis or on top of previous fracture. Uh, no, this uh, no history of trauma. So it is an advanced stage of trabezium metacarpal osteoarthritis. Okay, uh, and what options? How would you first of all? How would you examine actually? So they examine the patient. Uh, trabezium metacarpal osteoarthritis is was of the differential diagnosis of pain all over the radial side of the rest. So my examination will have a lot of uh, diagnosis need to be uh, detected and uh, uh, excluded, including lethal van, including um, staphoid fractures or trabezium uh, or step or lunate uh, arthritis or uh, distal rest uh, arthritis. Um, in addition to detection any sign of carpal tunnel, um, I will go along the, uh, the firstly the DIP joints, detect any arthritis or decrease of range of motion, and then again proximally to the uh, carpal joint, doing a grand test and detect any sign of tenderness along the side, up to reaching to the rest, and um, I will aim to detect any signs of carpal tunnel in addition to doing an hand function test. 
Um, from this point of view, I will do an uh, x-rays, which including the one I have in addition to lateral view. And then I dispatch the patient the option of management, which after I exhaust all of non-surgical uh, procedures according to NICE guidelines, including injection, using of a brace, and doing modification of, of activity and physiotherapy. In this yeah. case, in, I just need to know what is the age of the patient and uh, what's her hand dominance and what her expectations. So this is her right hand. She's she's right hand dominant. Um, she's 55. You do the grind test and it is clearly very painful. Um, she's tried injections and it's a temporary effect. What, what's the next option? So uh, in this case, I will. Um, she's 55 and she's hand dominant the same side. Yes. And you still working? Uh, yes. Um, so in this case, I will. Um, advise her to proceed for trapezectomy. Um, I was in a trapezectomy uh, without using an, a key wire fixation of the distal sump. And I will give her an accounting that uh, there is a decrease of the grip of the hand will uh, be postoperatively, and there is a chance of a proximal migration of the sump in the future. Okay, and what do you think of uh, just trapeziectomy or LR LRTI as well? So uh, the evidence based uh, done by Mr. Um, um, so the evidence based don't give any advantage for a trapezectomy plus any other ligament reconstructions or using of the fixed carbide radialis to do reconstruction and the trapezectomy alone giving the same results with any other procedures. Right, and let's assume, let's pretend for a minute that she, this is actually a, you know, 32 year old manual labor. Would that change your management at all in terms yes. of surgical in, options? In this case, I will be keen to give this patient a uh, proper hand grab and afraid of developing of any for any uh, upfront uh, or any in future, any uh, proximal migration of the sump. So I will advise him to go to an effusion of the basal sump. Okay, very good. Um, that's your five minutes up on my timer anyway. Um, I think you obviously knew what that was there. Uh, I would say uh, in terms of the, you know, I asked you specifically about the examination. I think you, I think you could have done that better. I think you could have started off with the basic principles and, you know, it took a while to get to the obvious, which was the grind test, you know, and the functional assessments and, I probably wouldn't start off examining the DIPs and things. I, I'd start off with a more basic examination first. Um, in terms of the basic science, I probably would have mentioned uh, some of the stuff about like the beak ligament and and you know what causes a Z deformity and that kind of stuff. Um, I just felt that you knew everything there, but it just needed a little bit of prompting from from my end, at least. Uh, comments? Yeah, I, I completely agree with uh, Sharif there. Uh, also, uh, other than the Z-plasty, is there uh, wasting in the thinner eminence? I, yeah. From my point, I didn't hear you. You might have said it. Yeah, I, did not. Uh, yeah, I, I, I mentioned um, okay. Reduction deformity and uh, decrease of the size of the web, first web, side, web space, sure. but thinner eminence I didn't mention. Yeah, so if you're going to go that route, then you'll tell me, you have to tell us why you think there, if there is a thin, thinner wasting, thinner eminence wasting, why you think this, is, this has happened. <laughs> and again, giving differentials is very important. You know, they, they want you to see that you are able to differentiate between one thing and the other. You get me, but and again, you know, like with practice, this will become better. I think you gave you gave some differentials. There. I mean, you, you know, it's you know, radial sided wrist pain. You know, that can be loads of things. You know, STT arthritis, to Quervins, which you mentioned, C six radiculopathy, snack, you know, radio scaphoid. Uh, so yeah, I think you mentioned some of them, but I think that just could have been a little bit smoother, is and maybe less prompting. I would say. Sure. Thank you.
So shall we do the next one? Yeah, yeah. So this is a uh, five month old. Um, his mum's noticed that his right shoulder is not quite the same as the left. Uh, what do you see? So this is uh, clearly a hypoplastic formation of the right uh, of right scapula uh, in the five months years old. Uh, sorry, in five months kids. So I believe it is a sprinkle deformity. Um, I need to examine the patients from front and see if this patient have any torticollis, and I need to examine him generally, axially and peripherally. Um, I believe it may be an, uh, either an isolated sprinkle deformity. Or, Can you uh, just before we get into all of that, we just describe what happens to the scapula? What what's the so the what, problem what? is the, the the scapula is hypoplastic, lateral deviated, and was uh, list was hypoplastic formation of the muscle of the upper medial corner of the clavicle of the scapula. Right, and if you were to sorry, yeah, if you were to, if you were to examine him, what 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 was the main loss of motion? I think the main loss of motion is um, uh, uh, forward and lateral abduction of the shoulder. Uh, mainly the Soraco, uh, uh, the Soraco clavicular, uh, um, the, the last 45 degree of the shoulder abduction is lost. Yes, yeah, shoulder abduction. Uh, OK, and are you aware of the etiology at all? Uh, it is, if it's part of the clavicular syndrome, it's usually uh, loss of segmentation according to the Swanson classification. Right, okay. Uh, anything else it's associated with? It's usually associated with torticollis as part of the syndrome. Okay, uh, anything else at all? Don't worry. No, we can yes, yes it can be a can be Down syndrome. Was it can be part of a Down syndrome? But uh, twenty one years me. Right. Okay. I'm not sure about that, but maybe. Um, okay. So how would you manage this child? Um, so usually uh, there is a lot of surgical intervention can be made to uh, send down the uh, the. Uh, the scapula, and usually there is an apart uh, between the spine and between the upper medial angle of the scapula and need to be resected. Uh, there is a lot of description of surgical intervention, but usually we wait until six years before we do this procedure, and then uh, we, do, uh, we do an uh, approach and remove the bar and try to um, stretch the muscles and get the scapula to the proper place. And where would that sort of surgery be done? Uh, sorry, it, it's for, more, for sure it is not for, uh, I will not do it myself. This patient needs to be referred to a uh, uh, specialized upper limb pediatric surgeons. Uh, great. And uh, that's probably all I can ask you without giving anything else away. Um, we're up to four minutes now. I think um, uh, when you've shown something like this and it's obvious sprangle, but I, I think you probably should have just mentioned, you know, the you mentioned it hyperplastic, but, you know, high riding, medially rotated. Um, and the obvious, you got to it eventually, but the obvious thing is that they can't abduct. So their abduction is limited usually to 110 degrees or so. Um, and it's more common in females than male. I uh, mentioned clip or fail, uh, which is associated with, but also scoliosis, you know, diastomyelia, kidney disease, some other things like that. Um, uh, uh, and there is a bar which you mentioned, but before you get into sort of the super specific stuff, you know, I would, you know, I like the way you answered the first question when we were talking about um, uh, what was the first uh, scenario? Club hand, you know, you talk about, you know, specialist care and, you know, if I were in the specialist centre, this is what I would do. But you you just want to make sure that you're not, you know, managing this yourself in your own sort of fracture clinic. Uh, and I sort of had to draw that out of you a little bit. Um, 
I don't think you'd get asked about the specific procedures, um, but they're called Woodward or the Green Procedure. But I, I think that's definitely sort of level eight kind of stuff. But again, uh, just stay on the basics initially and just mention all the information you know. So a little bit of the, you know, the clinical uh, presentation, you know, and then, <coughs> excuse me, a little bit of the etiology uh, and the associations and how it would present to the patient. And then you can get on to the sort of high, high, high marking stuff. Uh, yes. I think you missed something important, but I can't remember what it is now. But I think you said something that I thought was a bit controversial, but I don't know. We should have written it down. Maybe someone else would have noticed. I'm sorry, I didn't notice that. that okay. I, right. did. I did notice that you, you jumped straight away to Springle uh, shoulder. Just a little bit of description would go a long way. Just to show that you are, you, you're still, it's not just a spot diagnosis it's you know like oh you're describing it's yes it's in keeping with with the high writing and everything else but and then always remember they want you to see multidisciplinary they want everything in a multidisciplinary approach that uh, you're going to get uh, uh, the peds guys but also you want to rule out any other uh, 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 any other associated uh, abnormalities and so on. So just just bear that in mind. Yes. Anything else, Shuri? Uh, no, I think that was OK. But again, it's just um, uh, like for, for every like these are all um, like for the for the obvious things, uh, you've really got to score highly like, you know, the bar for something pretty an obvious spot diagnosis is going to be higher than something that no one's ever heard of. So you've just got to make sure that for the obvious conditions, and maybe this one isn't so obvious because you don't see it that often, but it's kind of an obvious exam question, if you see what I mean. You know, you won't see a sprinkle shoulder in every fracture clinic you do, but but it's it's common in the exam. And so for those sorts of things, you've really got to almost have like a card with all the salient points that you just get out, at, you know, in a sort of logical manner. You guarantee yourself the pass, and then you try and work yourself up to a to a seven and eight. Um, so I was always a fan of like you know describe the abnormality, describe the appearance, describe the difficulty, and this is con just consistent with Sprengel, you know. And so you get all those points initially, and then um, you can move on. Yeah, fair point. Uh, okay, uh, I'll move on to the next one. Oh, uh, is Jack still here? No, he's he's had to leave. He's got oh, okay. to leave. OK, thank you. Uh, OK, uh, well, we might as well get the next two done. Uh, then we've done all six upper limb. Um, so this is a 50 year old man. Uh, I'm sorry, the picture doesn't probably project it when it's too precise up very high, but there's a scar there on the dorsal aspect on the radial side of his hand. Uh, would you like to describe the image, please? So this is an, um, a, a clinical picture uh, which shows a um, left hand, and clearly there is an, uh, a wound over the most probably. I think it is an anatomical snuff box, which oblique uh, mm -hmm. ended up by um, flexion of the IP of the left sump, which yes. I is an, uh, pictures of traumatic injury of extensive pulses on this. Yeah, so I can tell you that he had a just a radial fracture two years ago. Uh, is it likely to be displaced or undisplaced? It's usually um, the extensive pulses on this uh, rupture as a complication of this radius usually come in non-displaced fractures. But the possible physiology is including that either in a, a decrease of blood supply or compartmental, which usually this pathology don't have an in a displaced form of a radius. It's usually non-displaced, which is causing either a compartment within the sheath or attrition after the healing. Okay, and uh, obviously I think the exams are back to face to face now, I think. So uh, just in front of your camera, would you just show us how you do a hand examination, a screening examination and focus on the EPL and EIP? So um, I will look for the uh, the cascade of the of all of the tendons 
in the sum, in, in loss of the extensive process longus, EMS and a specific movement called retropulsion, which usually is an extension with with uh, upward my, upward placement, which is different than abduction in the same way or abduction in uh, in a hand facing forward. So it's a retropulsion uh, movement, which is responsible to be done by extensive process longus. And will face him down, push him on the back, and then backward and upward movement of the all of the sump. And we can feel the tendons stretch with this range of, with this movement. Okay, and the functional assessment. So the hand functional assessment is really involved in a five movements. It's either in a tap or in a side, which means uh, catching a hand or a key or a grab or uh, uh, carrying or a touch. So it's five different movements uh, of hands give us a um, global idea about the function of the hand. OK, um, and how would you manage this man? So uh, I understand this is um, injury is back for a while, so it is in a chronic, not an acute form of a tendon disruption. So mm. I will do a clinical assessment and then um, I will uh, using uh, maybe I do an ultrasound and detect uh, uh, the proximal, uh, sorry, the distal part of the uh, of the tendon. And then I will use the extensor indices to uh, uh, doing the tendon transfer to an S3 incisions. One of them over the site of the uh, the same site of the injury, and one of them is on the rest, and one of them is in the metacarpophalangeal joint to get the extensor indices. And if you had to do a reconstruction, so this one I will do. I will use an um, um, it's called a stent or a um, nylon uh, catheter, and they're using it as an S3 stages. OK, uh, and what graphs could you use there? In this case, I will be using the, uh, the, uh, the extensor indices again. Anything else you could use as an available yeah, I graph? Using, I can use a uh, part of the uh, uh, tendo Achilles. I can use an ash, um, um, Belmais longus. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a long way to go for an Achilles tendon when you've got Palmaris longus right there. Yes. Uh, you could use plantaris, I suppose. Uh, OK, uh, and then uh, how would you rehabilitate them? So this is, um, again, it's an MDT approach with specifically we went on a hand physiotherapy. Uh, so this patient, as, uh, as part of management of extensive tendon, they will be kept in extended position with either an, uh, an a passive or an uh, controlled active which there is an evidence that the control active giving an appreciation than the passive one, and specifically in the form of uh, catch and keep. Uh, so I will I, I will put him in a splint, an extension position, and ask him to do an, a passive every now and then flexion of the of the thumb, and they will refer him to the hand physiotherapy after three days postoperatively. And I, I suspect that this will be healing while moving, and I expect to see him again after 28 days. OK, and what are the common complications? And you mean uh, as part of, of surgery? Yeah. Yeah, so the most common complication is adhesions and uh, loss of excursions of the tendons, which you need usually an officer intervention in form of adhenolysis or tendinolysis. Um, and in addition to the uh, short term complications, which including neurovascular injuries, um, it, um, regional, uh, gen regional pain syndrome, um, and for, 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 for sure, if the, if the patient has this position for a long time without tender transfer and in loss of the end of motion of the joints, you may be getting arthritis. Sure, OK, uh, I think that's our time up. Um, yeah, I think 
you know, again, good information. Just uh, you've, got, you've really got to listen to the examiner. So when they say, you know, show me how you'd examine the hand, you've, you've really got to show them. Um, so don't just talk about it, but actually show it uh, and make sure they can see it on the camera. And again, start with the basic stuff. So the, you know, the functional assessment, the, the grip, the pinch key, the, you know, that, all that kind of stuff. Um, because again, I felt like I had to drag it out of you a little bit. Um, so you've really got to ex listen to exact words that they ask you. Um, uh, you know, and you, you know, if I say, you know, EPL and EIP, you know, show how you would differentiate the two. Um, uh, in terms of uh, treatments and surgeries, I think that's OK, but just make sure you really listen to the examiner and do exactly as they're asking you, you know. Yes, uh, I agree with, I agree with you, Sharif. You know, like, Mohammed, don't worry. This will come up over and over again. To be honest, I couldn't see you examine the, the hands. I don't know if it's uh, in the, the the camera itself or not, but just make sure that the examiner can see you. Uh, and you make it clear to them that you are showing them how to do it. If they're saying show us, they don't want you to talk. They want you to show you to show them what you're doing. OK. Are, are the exams in person now or are they are yes, they still? Yes. Yeah, yeah, OK, person, yeah. So that should be a little bit easier. But, you know, just I think it's people, you know, people often don't listen to the examiner. You, you've really got to listen. Just wait a second, make sure you've understood. And, you know, sometimes they'll ask you to do three things in a row. Don't just do the third thing. Do the first thing first, then the second, then the third. You know, just make sure you, you you do exactly as they're asking you. Otherwise, you lose points, and they won't necessarily prompt you. They'll, you know, the examiners meet up the night before in the hotel where they're going to do the FRCS, and they go through every single short case, every single long case, every single Viva station, and they decide, and they have a checklist: one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight. What makes a five? what makes a six, what makes a seven, what makes an eight. And if you, in order to get a six or a seven, you've got to say the things that they decide on the night before. So if, if for me a six is functional assessment of the hand, if you don't demonstrate a functional assessment of the hand, you don't get a six. You might have enough to get a seven, but you've just missed that basic point. So you really listen to what they say because it's not so much about oh this guy knows what he's saying they do sit through every single case the night before and they decide between all of them in this massive lecture theater what's a five what do you have to say for a six what do you have to demonstrate for a seven etc cetera, etc cetera. cool uh let's do the last I one i find it i find it very difficult with the clinicals to know how to get a seven and an eight i don't know if you have any experience with that uh, sharif um, I think, you know, with the clinicals, um, you know, you've got to say, you've got to say the basics. Um, and like I said, you've got to say the things that they expect you to say, uh, but you've got to do it with like style and panache. They've got to be like this guy, you know, it's like if I examine a hip, it's different than when I examine someone's ankle, like, because I do a hip examination like 10 times, 20 times a week, right? So, you know, I know what I'm doing with an ankle. I don't know what I'm doing. I can still get the points across, but but it doesn't look as obvious that I'm doing this every day. Right. So you've really got a like the, the key to clinicals is actually doing lots and lots of clinical and and doing it in the way that the examiners are used to. And so this is why foreign graduates always find it much harder than the UK graduates, because the knowledge is amazing, but they don't look and speak and talk and examine patients like the examiners do. And so you've really got to do that to the best of your ability and just get lots and lots and lots of practice. And like we're doing today, just, you know, like we're telling you, your knowledge is really good, but you've really got to listen to what I'm telling you and you've got to do it in the order that I want you to do it in. Yes, thank you very much. OK, so uh, one more. Uh, yes, uh, let's do the last one. Um, so uh, this is uh, clinical pictures. I think it's pretty obvious, but uh, the foot first uh, and then the hand there. What do you see? So this is um, two clinical pictures, one of them showing in the hand 
with clay liposology in the skin and soft and subcutaneous tissue, and the other one on the uh, foot. The only uh, point which can connect both of them, that is the dupetrine with uh, plantar fibromatosis uh, or plantar fibrosis, uh, which is really accompanying and uh, dupetrine, and it's a sign of uh, uh, dupetrine diseases, and they have the same uh, pathology and the same cause. Um, yeah. Where else so would you, where you might check it? Where else would it potentially be? One more place. So there's another two places which can be seen, including the penile and the the penile uh, yes pin and the garrots uh, the garrots um, bats. And the okay. Of the hand. Right. Uh, and what would you find on inspection? So um, this um, an inspection, we expect that I, I have an, a clear form of um, uh, court and uh, tethering and note and a swelling and deflections of uh, either the carbophalangeal joints or uh, BIP or uh, the interphalangeal joints, only the BIP. Um, and my concern would be if, to be sure that uh, to know if there is a family history or there is any disease uh, which causing this uh, problem, including an alcohol and uh, smoking or a previous trauma, uh, bilaterality, uh, hand dominance, age, uh, previous surgery, and uh, during my examination, my uh, assessment is including to detect mainly an meridial side affections, which I mean in a severe form of affection, and uh, getting from uh, in the proximal and distal, uh, sorry, proximal and dorsal aspect of the hands, looking for any gas, pads, uh, detecting the code from uh, medial to lateral, and the different extent of the code from uh, uh, proximal to distal. And then Hurston uh, table test, and then detecting the angle of veteran deformity, and doing an uh, assessment of the vascularity of the fingers and yes. of the uh, of the hand, and finally doing a uh, carpal tunnel assessment. Okay. Uh, before we get into all of that, uh, can you tell me a little bit about the pathophysiology? Uh, so the pathophysiology is usually it is an uh, autosomal dominant disease which mm. affecting mainly the Western country with predominance in the uh, white uh, SNX uh, and Europe in particular, and it's having a family hereditary. Um, it is usually uh, fibro uh, consists of uh, fibro um, myofibroblast and yeah. it really goes through uh, three stages and. Um, the, the main uh, two items in the pathology cascade of formation of this disease is myofibroblast, which is the muscles, and uh, it is, sorry, a fibroblast, which have an actin inside, and the formation of a stage of, uh, of inflaring of, uh, of uh, forming of this fibrosis mainly depend on collagen type 3. Yes, okay. And looking at that picture, I know it's hard without an examination. What do you think are the, is a predominant cord there that is causing this contracture? So this is a central cord. Uh, it's a, starting from a pretendinous cord on the palm and extending down to uh, uh, the carbopharyngeal joint. Yes. Uh, so the central cord to then cause MCPJ contracture. What if you had a PIPJ contracture? So we're speaking of here about spiral cord. Spiral cord. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, we're running out of time a little bit. Uh, treatment options. Uh, rather than just list them all, what would be your, you know, what's your algorithm for the options, you know, what would... So before I, I go to the management, uh, these patients need to be managed by specific hand surgeons. It mm -hmm. is not my speciality, but uh, the, the baseline of management that discussing with the patients that we mainly manage this hand as part of a functional disturbance, not for the pain, mainly. Um, before I get any flexion deformity uh, more than 30 degree, I will try to avoid any surgical intervention. If I get metacarbophalangeal flexion deformity more than 30 degrees, so I would proceed for surgery. Uh, and my um, operative management will be including an, uh, a splint, uh, uh, doing some stretching. After 30 degrees, which will really affect the hand function of the patients, I will proceed for a limited uh, mastectomy. Uh, if the patient have an abbreviated history of surgery, and they will be using an appropriate by using an asking graft. Right. Okay. Uh, all right. We'll we'll stop it there. I, I think um, 
you know, this is two patrons you just have to absolutely nail. I uh, obviously knew the information, but this is one where I, I have a card and I would say, you know, this is an autosomal dominant disease. The predominant cell is my fibroblast, you know, type three collagen, uh, resident in here. This is an ectopic manifestation. You get all of that out of the way, you're onto a winner already. Um, with regards to the management, you know, I, I would have maybe answered that a little bit differently and said, look, the treatment option, the surgical treatment options are or the, you know, the intervention type options are, you know, collagenase injection, needle laparinectomy, and then surgical resection uh, or fasciectomy plus minor skin graft. You know, and then I asked you about the, you know, how would you, you know, your sort of, you know, how, how would you choose which one to do? And I think you, that's what you could answer a little bit better, I think. So yeah, that's, yeah. So, sorry, I'd go, go ahead, Matas. Basically, it's it, these are all very easy to, to to diagnose. Okay, so you know that like you need to say the buzzwords in order to maximize the points you get. And in one of these points, no, maybe a couple of these points is where you're gonna hit a six, then a seven, and then an eight. If it's not smooth enough, then or you, when you when you're saying we're running out of time tell me the management plan or your algorithm quickly you want to get collagenases injections as quickly as possible do you get me unfortunately i'm, I'm not sure if, if you remember or not, because i mentioned collagenase injections about three times in these five before and i have been hit it before that this is not used in uk anymore it was when used in, in in usa so maybe also Hosni can give us about this thing because I, I mentioned collagenase before, and they they say no, it won't be used in UK at all. I, well, I, you know, I'm actually not a hand surgeon. It's been a while since I've done the exam, but you could just say that. You could say, look, the options are aponeurectomy, collagenase, which are no longer licensed in the UK, you know, fasciectomy plus or minus skin graft. Uh, in this case, I'd use that. I, you know, I'd use a you know, needle aponeurectomy works better for MCPJ. The recurrence rate is so and so. There's a complications listed here. I think that's inappropriate for this age group. I would use a fasciectomy. You know, you just uh, just um, you know, you could talk about it quickly without having to go into a lot of detail and then they'll ask you about it if you need to. I, I, I actually wasn't aware that collagenes aren't licensed anymore. Is that true? I don't know, but what you need to do, Ruby, is find a hand surgeon hmm. and ask them, OK, what do I say? Write it down and ask them what you need to say. Yeah. OK. Uh, that's all the upper limbs I repair but I do have a list of lower limbs as well um, that maybe we can do next time I think that's probably too yes. much punishment now for <laughs> I think reason. your brain is I can see your brain swollen now I need I don't want you to hate us I'm sorry man we, we've all been yeah. through it <laughs> no uh, thank you uh, thank you ever so much for your time I'm really yeah. grateful and uh, appreciate it totally appreciate it thanks a lot no no problem at all very, very, very beneficial session thanks a lot no, that's okay. Let's do. Um, you know, like I've I've got um, I've got long cases. I've got lower limbs. I've got a list somewhere that I wrote down of all the all of my exam cases and all of my friends. And so, um, you know, if you email me, I'll I'll send you those uh, things. And like I say, like if you get something weird and wonderful, don't worry too much. Just stick to basic principles. The the bar will be a little bit lower than if you get a dupatrins. You know, if you get a dupatrins, you just have to nail it. You can't, you know, you can't mess it up because that is it's so obvious that you know you, you just And have that's to why people fail trauma because the expectation yes. is very yes. high. Yes, very that's high. right. That's right. And you know what? Everybody says it and everyone, you know, trauma for me was the hardest. You know, peds, basic science all no problem at all but trauma you know the thing that we do every day in our jobs actually for me was the hardest station it wasn't easy great absolutely Sharif, right. thank you ever so much again and ruby tomorrow jag is going to give us a session about either you he he, he said either tips and tricks or another viva for you cool. okay thanks a lot okay then Sharif, thank you ever so much again until we meet. Yeah, you're welcome. Just let me know when when you want me to do another session and I'll I'll make time.
will do. Thank you very much. Okay. okay. All right. Guys, have, have a good nice night. evening. Good bye night. Bye. See you guys. Bye-bye.